I'm Adrienne LaFrance, the Atlantic's Executive Editor. Thank you so much for being with us. Very glad you're here. And I'm very glad to be joined today by Eric Schmidt, the former Google CEO and co-author of The Age of AI. Welcome, Eric, and thank you so much for being with us. Um, so great to be with you. I want to start with the book you have coming out, The Age of AI. Um, and I want to start by asking, you know, for decades, we've sort of been waiting for artificial intelligence to catch up with the imagination that we've had for it. Um, and that took a while. And it seems now that that moment really is upon us where this technology is advancing incredibly rapidly. Um, and I wanted to start just by asking you how different you think life will be a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, as a result of where we are in AI advancement. Well, we think it's going to be quite different. And the reason we think it's quite different is we think that this is the beginning of a new epoch of human civilization. Frankly, when the Renaissance happened, uh, we developed collectively 500 years ago, the notion of reason, the notion that things did not just descend from God, that independent actors could criticize each other. Under that same argument, the arrival of a different intelligence that's not human-like but similar to humans is such a watershed moment. Uh, we're working hard to make that happen. It will have a lot of implications, many of them incredibly good, but many of them very concerning. We wrote the book to try to cover both scenarios. So you're invoking the scientific revolution, you know, the age of enlightenment. I've been wondering, just as thinking about sort of recent tech revolutions we've lived through, I think about the sort of triple revolution of the internet, smartphones, and the social web. But I'm curious for your views on, in terms of what we can be prepared to experience, is this bigger than all three of those? I mean, how does it compare to an already really um, sort of accelerated speed of technological development in the past, even just 20 years? I do think it will be bigger, and uh, the authors collectively disagree on how positive or negative, but we articulate these points in the book. If you look back 20 years ago, people were talking about social networks. No one had any idea that social networks be would become so important and would shape the political discourse, elections, how people are treated. It would give a voice to people who are uh, underrepresented, but also people who we don't necessarily want to hear from. And we didn't at the time understand the implications of putting everyone on the same network. We need to think now of what happens when artificial intelligence is co-resident with us in the world. It lives with us, it watches us, it helps us. Maybe it interferes with us occasionally. We don't really know. I'll give you a good example. If you imagine a child born today, you give the a child a baby toy, a, a, a bear and that bear is AI enabled. And every year the child gets a better toy. Well, every year the bear gets smarter. And in a decade, the child and the bear who are best friends are watching television and the bear says, I don't really like this television show. And the kid says, yeah, I agree with you. Okay, what do we think about that? What do we think when humans and these AI systems become best friends? Do we lose our communications and our warmth among humans or does it get stronger? We don't know. What happens when the elderly who are often very lonely uh, find themselves dealing with inanimate objects who they treasure far more than their human caregivers? We just don't know. Well, I mean, you're posing it as a question. What do we think of it? I can tell you, I, I find it mildly creepy, the bear, the bear best friend example, but I'm curious what you think is when you, and of course, it's incredibly complex, but would you want your children, your grandchildren to be raised with an AI best friend? Does that concern you or is it exciting to you? Like where on the spectrum do you fall? Well, I think a lot depends on, on how it actually works. Um, if that AI best friend is also the best teacher in the world, the best mentor in the world, the warmest possible version of what a child needs, then I'm all for it. But let's imagine that this bear has a hidden bug in it that was inserted from some evil person where the bear is slightly racist, right? Which is a value that I do not want my child to be exposed to. Uh, that's not okay. Or let's reverse the scenario and imagine that I am in fact a racist, which I'm not, and I want my bear to be racist and I want a programmed racist bear. We haven't figured out what the rules are, right? 
And because these are systems that will be interacting with humans every day, they will have an outsized impact on their experience of daily life. The information space, the social world that we all live in now is so governed by the online media and frankly, many of the attributes of click and clickbait and all those other kinds of things, it's really disturbing. Now, as you know, uh, Dr. Kissinger wrote in 2018, an article which was entitled, How the Enlightenment Ends. And we followed up with a uh, article in the Atlantic called The Metamorphosis. So we've been working on this for a while, also in the Atlantic. We've been working on these ideas for a while to frame them in a context, not about that technology, which hopefully we will describe accurately, but rather on how society will react to this and it's coming fast. Dr. Kissinger says his concern is us technologists are building this stuff without a historical record and without an understanding of the deep issues in humanity that we are touching in our technology. You chaired the 2021 National Security Commission on AI, and one of the recommendations that came out of it was to reject or recommend to President Biden to reject a ban on autonomous weapon systems, so AI weapon systems. Um, and that recommendation runs against uh, an argument that many of your peers have made in terms of, you know, fear of a world in which AI weapons would make battle decisions that we can't understand or explain. Um, talk a little bit about your position and why you come down where you do. So as a general comment about AI, when I speak about AI, most of my friends think I'm talking about a robot that is gone or muck and a woman scientist slays the robot. Right, and that, that's how what we think we're talking about. But we're not talking about that. What we're talking about are information systems and knowledge systems that are with us every day. And today, it's fair to say that those systems are imprecise, they're dynamic in that they change all the time. They're emergent in that when you combine them, you can get unexpected behaviors, some good, some bad, and they're capable of learning. Well, it's the combination of those four points that makes these AI systems both problematic, but also very powerful. So if you then apply it to a life critical decision, and I can think of no more life critical decision than the launch of a very, very deadly weapon, how would we know that the computer was making the right decision? We can't prove it. It makes mistakes. It's a mistake that's intolerable. People who think that this is an easy problem, let me give you another example. And we talk about this in the book. You're on a ship and there's a missile coming in that you can't see. And the AI system is telling you about this and says, you will be dead if you don't press this button within 20 seconds. Now the, the rule in the military is the human needs to be in control. And this is no question, the human has to press the button. What are the odds of that human not pressing the button? Pretty low. So, so the, the notion of the compression of time in the context mm -hmm. of these life critical decisions, especially in military defense, is really important. If you go back to um, the, uh, the original sort of RAND studies about automatic defense, and if you go back to the movie with Peter Sellers where um, they, uh, they threatened to launch a nuclear weapon and the doomsday machine, if you will, automatically launches one in return, which is retaliatory, is a good proxy for what we're talking about. I'll give you another example. We're, we're collectively as an industry working on general intelligence and the general intelligence will emerge in the next 10 or 20 years and depending on how you define it, those systems will be enormously powerful. And those systems will be enormously dangerous in the wrong hands. So they're gonna to have to be treated as in a way similar to nuclear weapons, but with a new doctrine, because we don't understand proliferation. We don't understand um, how to do containment with these new weapon systems. Well, and I wanna go back to that in a minute, the question of sort of like what happens to our theories of deterrence with these new kinds of weapons. But first you, you began to sort of allude to the geopolitical context here, which I'm curious to hear you speak a bit more about just, you know, if sort of the, the U.S. position in all of this relative to what we imagine China might do or Russia might do. And, and you write about this in the new book a bit as well. But 
talk about the extent to which your uh, your position that we sh should reject a ban on autonomous weapons is about making sure that the United States stays strong relative to these other superpowers. Um, yes. So the, the core argument that we're making is that there will be a small number of countries that will master this technology. And it's important that there be discussions about how to limit them. It's important that those discussions be bilateral. The number of company countries, excuse me, that will be able to field at this level will be by the handful. So a reasonable expectation will be that these kinds of systems, when they eventually emerge, will be under the control of large national governments, such as the United States and China, and maybe a few others. We feel quite strongly that the discussions about where the limits and lines should be should start now. We don't want a situation where there has to be an explosion before there's a treaty. If you go back to 1945, uh, with the, the use of nuclear weapons in uh, World War II, which ended it, there was no treaty at the time banning or limiting their use. And we spent the next 15 years, and Dr. Kissinger was a key player in this, developing the concepts of containment, uh, mutually assured destruction, balance of power, and so forth. We're gonna need to rediscover those in this new age of dangerous weapons. When you were Google CEO in 2006 is when Google acquired YouTube, and it was a very, very different internet then. Um, and now YouTube is among one of, you know, it's one of the places where we see the spread of extremism and misinformation among many other platforms, including Google as well, for that matter. Um, and I wonder sort of what you wish you knew then um, and how differently you see platforms and perhaps what their responsibilities are relative to 2006 or 2010 even. Well, I can tell you in the 2000s, our view, and I think I speak for the company during that time in the industry, was the American view that the solution to more information is more, in, that information is more information. And so we took a position that was quite aggressively against removing content, even if it was harmful. And we viewed that as both the right thing technologically, but also the right thing culturally. And we were criticized heavily in other countries for this. To me, the most interesting thing about COVID as an on long online has been that platforms like, like Twitter and um, Facebook, which have resisted any form of takedown, have worked aggressively, or they claim to be working aggressively, to take down COVID misinformation. So COVID is an example of something where falsehoods are on the other side of the line. I can tell you today, I'm not involved with it. I've left Google. YouTube has a team which makes these decisions every day and tries to figure out what the line is. So you get to decide where you think that line is. Many people I know believe that the kind of lying and misinformation that goes on on social media is on the other side of the line. It should be prohibited. But I don't know how to prohibit it in a systematic way. And I furthermore believe that the people who are spreading misinformation will get access to these tools that will make it even easier for them to spread information. The industry has got to figure out a way to stop the spread of misinformation. One of them, by the way, just to digress technically, is that the information is not watermarked in such a way that we know its origin. It would be relatively mm. easy, the industry as a whole, to start by saying, where did this information actually come from? Where did this picture or this text or video or whatever where did it enter all of our systems? And then who modified it? That alone would help us at least understand the source of the manipulation. Do you think it's possible that these platforms are just too big and humans shouldn't be connected at this scale? I think of, you know, Facebook has 2.9 billion users. Um, is it possible that this is just not how humanity is meant to be organized? Well, it's pretty clear that there are things that humans are not very good at. And one is a, a cascade of information. So we're not very good with rapid change, lots of information, information overload. It just causes our brains to go crazy. With maybe a few notable exceptions for normal people, it's like, oh my God, I just can't take it anymore. And it leads to rises in cortisol, stress, uh, perhaps mental illness, God knows. 
So we have a problem that the information that is coming at you is so profound. In our book, what we talk about is that this coexistence with this information resource that's driven by features that are not human, right, that are maybe human-like, is a change in the information space that is profound, right? And we worry a lot in the book about how, how do you regulate it? We're not in favor of censorship. We're not trying to filter people's opinions. What are the appropriate restrictions of the misuse of this new technology? Now, <clears throat> you haven't asked me all the great benefits of all of this. Uh, let me give you an example of why we should fight for AI. Um, the people I talk to in science, which is where I spend most of my time now, would love to have an AI that would just read everything because the explosion in knowledge in science is overwhelming their brilliant brains. So you can imagine that the AI system, which sees everything and can, and can summarize, can be used to move biology forward, drug discovery forward, and so forth at an enormous uh, rate. We, uh, in the introduction to our book, we use three index points. The first is AlphaGo, which beat the Korean and Chinese competitor mm. people in the world and invented moves that had never been seen in 2,500 years. I know because I was physically present when this happened. We talk about a drug called Halicin, where the computer took 100 million compounds, figured out how they worked, and figured out how to assemble a new broad class antibiotic that had never been conceived of, which is in trials now. And we also talk about what a technology called GPT-3, which is a representative of what are called universal models, where they read everything and then you try to figure out what they understand and what they can do, and the results are miraculous. We're just at the beginning of this ramp that I'm describing. And now is the time for our book, in my view, why we wrote it, to say, let's figure out how we wanna handle these things. So for example, is it okay, I use my facetious example of the bear, is it okay to have a racist bear? Maybe, maybe people will think that's okay. I don't think it's okay, but that's an appropriate debate to have. Let's have it now. Final question for you, and it's somewhat existential. You've written before that the intelligence in artificial intelligence is sort of needlessly anthropomorphic and that we need to reframe the way we think about what knowledge is, which is what you're, you've just sort of talked about as well. Um, I wonder quickly what your view is of what human intelligence then becomes. If machines can do all of the things we can do and better, is there any form of intelligence that remains uniquely human? And should there be? Should we worry if there isn't? Um, what realm remains ours? I could speculate that in a few hundred years, there will probably be no places where computer intelligence is not as good as humans. But certainly for the rest of all of our lifetimes, there will be things that are uniquely human that involve the synthesis of ideas out of left field, things which are just true ideas, true new discovery, true innovation. If you look at the pattern of AI, it's not replacing the brilliant lawyers, columnists, writers, teachers, researchers. It's replacing menial jobs. So what happened with AI was it started working on vision and an awful lot of people just look and monitor things, which is pretty mind numbing. And that technology now, computers are better at vision than humans, which allows humans to be freed up to do higher order things. So for the foreseeable period, and certainly for our lifetimes, there will be a place for humans. Hopefully that place for humans is using what we do best, which is our creativity, our sense of art, our sense of morals, our sense of spirit. Those are gonna be very difficult for the current tasks and current focus of how AI evolves, at least in this generation of invention. Eric, thank you so much for being with us and thank you to everyone who has joined us. And thank you to The Atlantic for helping us with our two previous articles and helping promote our book. Congratulations on a fantastic conference today.